Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Portland State University Studio MFA Remote Artist Talk Series. This series is sponsored by generous contributions from the Wingate Foundation and Depreced Professorship Fund by the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation. We would like to, take, to start this event by acknowledging that Portland State University rests on the traditional village sites of the Montano, Kathomat, Clackamas, Bands of the Chinook, Tolatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and many other tribes who have made their homes along the Columbia River. Multano, Multanoma is a band of Chinooks that lived in this area. We thank the descendants of these tribes for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands since immemorial. This series brings together artists, curators, and critics from a variety of disciplines to explore the subjects of their work before a live audience. All of our lectures for spring term are being held remotely and live streamed through our PSU YouTube channel. Please follow our Instagram account at PSU Studio MFA to learn more about Artist Talks in the future. At the end of this morning's presentation, we'll be having a Q&A with Avantika Bawa and the MFA cohort, and we will also be fielding questions through the live stream chat on YouTube. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Avantika Bawa. Avantika Bawa is an artist, curator, and educator based in Portland, Oregon, and often resides in her hometown, New Delhi, India. Bawa has an MFA in painting from the School of Art of the Art Institute in Chicago and a BFA in the same from Maharaja Sayajiro University in Barado, India. She has participated in Skohagen, McDonald, McDowell, uh, Kochi Biennial Foundation, the Jagrashi residencies, among others. Noteworthy solo exhibitions include shows at the Portland Art Museum, the Schneider Museum in Ashland, Oregon, Soyama Space, Seattle, Washington, the Columbus Museum, Georgia Salt Works Gallery, and the Atlanta Contemporary Arts Center in Atlanta, Georgia, which was the Nature Mort in Gallery Masarka, India White Box Tilt Gallery and Project Space in, Dis in Disjeka, Portland, Oregon. In April of 2004, she was part of a team that launched DRAIN, Journal for Contemporary Art and Culture, and it's at www.drainmag.com. In 2014, Avantika was appointed to board the Oregon Arts Commission. She is currently Associate Professor of Fine Arts at the Washington State University in Vancouver, Washington. I'm going to give it to you, Avantika, and I can't wait to listen to your talk. Cool. Thank you, uh, Melanie. That was a really sweet introduction. And... Um, Ironically, I actually I'm I'm currently doing a residency at Yucca Valley Material Lab in Yucca Valley, California, but I live like two blocks from the PSU campus. So I'm pretending I'm back home sitting on my 15th floor veranda looking at PSU pretending you guys are there even though everyone is um um elsewhere. All right. I need to try and share and I need some Okay, here we go. All righty. Thank you, YouTube people who are tuning in from everywhere. And of course, a big thanks to everyone at PSU, specifically Ralph Bouguet, for inviting me to do this talk. Um, I have chosen to focus this talk on uh, a specific series of work, which is uh, mostly my scaffolds and some of my drawings. But a lot of my other work is available on my website, which I recently redesigned through Squarespace, and I'm very proud of it, so check it out. Um, I wanted to come up with a list of words instead of an artist statement, per se, that kind of hit the core of my inquiry. And even while I was looking at these last night, I didn't feel any one word really did it justice, even though sight has been emphasized. And I asked myself, if you had to describe your work in one word, what would that be? And I, I came down to the word essence and simple, but simple sounded a little lame to put out there. So I stuck with these that aren't necessarily that simple a list, but you'll see how they're kind of intertwined and uh, fuel the core of my practice. And this practice of mine is, is one where I'm really interested in drawing because it is a very intuitive and immediate and primal act. But I also like to see 
things that are more physical. So the intersection of drawing and painting, movement and stillness, functional and the non-functional, when they collide, that's where my practice emerges. And when I'm situating the practice, the geography of the site that I'm placing the work in, the architecture, the environment, the, the climate and the cultural differences in that landscape um, strongly inform the work I'm doing. I like to start with this piece as the first like formal work because it is it is it was done at the um, at a time where I wasn't making a lot of installations and this project supported through the Salem Arts Organization didn't have any funding but I needed to do it because I needed a blank slate where I could make an installation piece and this this uh, architecture was kind of perfect. The timing was nice because it was at the towards the end of winter and the beginning of spring. And then all I wanted was bursts of yellow. And you'll see throughout my work, it's like I need living in the Pacific Northwest. You all know what it's like. You need more vitamin D, especially by February, April. So I just wear yellow. I get, you know, I work with yellow and it's just yellow everywhere. So this was this work is kind of like an extension or a physical graphical extension of the landscape with a little bit of a graphic design touch with these spikes of graphite lines that are mimicking um, the grass in the background. While working with installations or even drawings, uh, whether they be micro installations like the ones you see out here that I did at McDowell, uh, a residency in, a north, uh, in the Northeast and I would encourage those of you who are Oregonians to look into this because the Ford family supports two or three fellows a year from the state to go experience this beautiful landscape and just make work. Um, I like to work with the color I see in an environment and if there's a lack of color, if it's a very green environment, I might work with a lot of red. So working with contrast and conflicts is something I'm um, really interested in doing. In these micro installations, uh, I wanted to, instead of looking at a pre-existing site, I was interested in a site that was soon going to be erected, which is this the library at McDowell and some of the blueprints of the plan that finally informed the work I was doing. So in my work, it, a sketch can often be the final product. Sometimes I start with sculpture and then reduce it to a sketch. Or I start with a blueprint and use that as the final product. I don't know if I'm making sense. I don't like the hierarchy where a sketch leads to a, a study of a painting and then the final painting is the work. Sometimes the sketch is the most important or sometimes there is no hierarchy. The maquette is more important than the final product. Um, where I am right now at Yucca Valley, where I'm learning how to cast in glass and it, it is highly difficult, but instead of focusing just on the final product, which I still haven't seen, I've been really enamored by just the shape of the molds the, the silicone cast, the waxes, and if I can just enjoy those for what they are and not worry about the final product, I, I'm far more excited by this process. So again, there's no hierarchy in my work um, in terms of sketches, maquettes, production, et cetera. I'm jumping forward to a very different project that I started in 2014, 2013. Um, it was, I received a grant from Washington State University that I didn't think I could and I, I would and I got this chunk of money and I was like I can do what I want and I, I want to do something that brings coastal uh, coastlines together and I, I guess I, I don't know what I'm trying to say I guess it was a wild idea and because I got funding that I think didn't think I could I just went ahead with this wild I idea the crux of which was to compare and contrast different coastlines in India and the US. So I reduced the coastlines to Cochin, which is in the southern tip of India. And I wanted to draw attention to this, these different coastlines, uh, history, topography, and climate. And I thought the easiest way to do that would be to you know, look at the mapping of uh, the routes in these places that were of uh, importance, either because of the maritime trade or because of their uh, military significance or because of the tourism. So I asked myself, like, you know, if I'm mapping out these different uh, routes that are of historical or cultural importance, how can I trace them? And I started by literally going back to GPS and using a Google pin. And that is, again, is in essence, what formed the work I finally did. I was like, oh, this is an orange dotted line that tells me 
how to move from point A to point B. What if this orange dot actually existed in space? What would it look like? So I uh, worked with an inflatable company to design this big orange ball. And I took the ball throughout these different locations in Cochin in India and then brought it to Annapolis and Baltimore and eventually Astoria. And basically was towing a big red ball, big orange ball through these waterways in these different cities with the intention of drawing attention to the cultural roots, the military roots, but also uh, embracing the bizarreness of a big orange ball being towed in the middle of the water in all these different places. So this, this video is a little bit long and things take a little while to load. So I'm gonna scrub through it. This was one of the first journeys I took where I placed the ball on a passenger ferry and did a video recording of the ferry moving from point A to point B. In this video, I was looking at the routes that the local Christian faith. And I also wanted to kind of uh, create a sense of the ball just disappearing into the horizon, recalling some of Bass Van Order's work. This is unlike most of the works I do because it's the one piece that had a lot of human interaction and initially I didn't want that, but eventually I was, I was okay with it. And I kind of embraced it. I think the piece came alive when people would glare at it or just question it. Sorry for my slow scrubbing. So this is in Astoria and I was watching this video last night and I know the ball is out there somewhere, but even I couldn't find it. But when it's on a larger screen, you can actually see that. And I chose Astoria because it is the graveyard of the Pacific Northwest, which is important to me. So just like Christo did with his umbrella piece years ago, comparing a landscape in Japan with that in California by planting blue and yellow umbrellas, I was kind of attempting to do the same having a conversation between these three coastlines that didn't really have anything in common but my work was aiming to draw attention to aspects of these coastlines so this is annapolis annapolis was one of the first cities i visited outside of chicago when i came to the us and i it struck me because it is uh, where the um, uh, u.s naval academy is and i grew up in the indian in an indian naval family and that, that, that uh, comparison or that parallel was of interest to me. Ironically, of all the places I've told this yellow or uh, this orange ball, the place that gave me the least grievance was, uh, was uh, Annapolis. Everywhere else I had to get permits or justify why I wanted to tow a big orange ball across the coastline. There you see the Naval Academy. And when I went to them for permission, they're like, what, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to tow an orange ball across uh, your waterways, they're like, okay. I was like, is that it? And they're like, yep. And then one one of these last shots is really nice. So this is now in Baltimore. Um, and this waterway opens into the Chesapeake Bay. I, I'm not doing justice by scrubbing through this really fast because the beauty of this piece is watching it kind of slow. But of course, in the interest of time, I'm scrubbing through it kind of quickly. But I want to end with one of the last shots. This was really sad and really fun, too. This, this guy I met, Brian, and he attached a GoPro. And this is December. It's freezing cold. And he was, you know, like, oh, yeah, I can do this. But then something crazy happens.
and it was so cold. He had no choice but to to swim ashore. We got him. We we rescued him. Got him coffee. Warmed him up, and he was okay. But he was more concerned about his paddleboard and his uh, GoPro, which we then found. It just floated away, and the camera just kept recording. And it was kind of gorgeous, and no one was hurt, and nothing was destroyed. Anyway, so that's that's a little um, viewing of the video of aqua mapping. Uh, after making the video, I, I created a few digital stills and made screen prints out of them. And the screen prints involved little dots of orange because I wanted to play with the idea of pointing and marking something that was already mapped out. I like the tongue and cheekness of putting a dot on a thing that's already there and obvious. So these orange ovals you see out here are screen printed onto the work. Through that work of pointing and mapping, I then created a series of more prints for a show that I did in Mississauga, which is a suburb of Canada. Uh, I was invited to do a show called exactly this, which is the area code of India and Pakistan. Uh, the two countries that have a lot of immigrants and people in, in the city of Mississauga. Um, so when I was invited, the curator said, I want you to do something that reflects Mississauga, but I don't have the budget to bring you in for a site visit. So the way I did my site visit was through Google Maps and, and the internet. And the, the image of Mississauga that kept coming up was this building, which is the Absolute Towers. And I knew I was going to work with it. And I was like, what is it about the, this, this tower that I like so much? And it's clearly the curves and the awkwardness of it. And I said, all right, I want to draw attention to this and this. And I, I literally, it was just a very literal tongue in cheek response to pointing at the very obvious aspects of these twin towers or these, uh, these absolute towers. Um, and these prints were made at Anderson Ranch, which is uh, a residency in, um, in Colorado. The irony with this, and there's an interesting story, is when I was pulling these photos from the internet and printing them at a high resolution, I didn't realize, I realized as I was working on them that I needed to get clearance from the photographer. And I eventually did. And I was like, look, I want to use your work to make these prints. Is it okay? And I was, it was like, I was a little concerned because I kind of started the work, but I knew if I hadn't got an okay from this guy, he would, I had to destroy the work. So I stalked him a little bit, or I found out a little bit about him, this thing's being recorded, so I need to be careful. And long story short, turns out he was very interested in visiting Portland, so we became friends, and, and then we ran a marathon together, the first one I ran, and he allowed me to use his prints. So this, this story has absolutely nothing to do with the work, but it just goes to show, like sometimes, you know, you're sitting in your little apartment in Portland, Oregon, making prints when you go to a residency and then suddenly you forge this whole new friendship with someone that then runs 26.2 miles with you. So uh, most of my work doesn't involve curved shapes, but these few did. Um, and this is one of the final ones that involves curves. It's a piece I did for um, a show at uh, PNCA at the Center for Contemporary Art. Uh, when I was invited to do the show, I think Ralph was in this show too. Um, I was told that this is my wall and I was making drawings on the wall and the drawing that I, uh, I was most drawn to was these circles I kept making on the wall, trying to play with a, uh, an oval within a rectangle, thinking a little bit about the things I talk about in my drawing one class. And what appealed to me most was the simple shape and its flatness. And I said, if I can retain that simplicity and flatness on a larger scale, I think the work will succeed. So I worked with a very dark black that's used in theater design. It's not the Vanta black, which was patented by then by Anish Kapoor. So as a response, as a bit of a like, uh, just like a bit of a critique to Anish Kapoor's ability to patent a color, I called it anti-Vanta. And um, if you looked at the work, you really felt that you were being sucked in. It was a very dark, dark, non-reflective black. All right, I'm moving very quickly ahead to something very different. And now I think I'm gonna be focusing mostly on my work with scaffolds and the straight lines that I do. 
In 2012, um, Gallery Mascara, which is a gallery I show with, it has now kind of closed. They invited me to do uh, my second solo show. The first solo show I'd done there involved a lot of boxes since the space was once a warehouse and I wanted to draw attention to its history as a warehouse. For the second show, which is images of what you see now, another documentation, I was more interested in what was going on outside of the gallery, which was a whole lot of construction. So I told the director that I wanted to build a wall or get some construction debris or somehow mimic things that you see at a construction site. And he was the first person to put this idea in my head and said, why don't you just use a scaffold? We have a lot of them sitting around here because the gallery is being remodeled and painted. So with that, my interest in scaffolds began. And since then I've been really just obsessed with the scaffold. I like its verticals, its diagonals. I like how ubiquitous and utilitarian it is. And I like how it can transform into something functional and gorgeous at the same time with just a little shift in color, a change in scale, et cetera. And then in 2016, I did another work with scaffolds, this time for the Portland Biennial in 2016. My site was the Astor Hotel in Astoria, which is apparently the tallest structure on the Oregon coast. Uh, the Astor Hotel was once upon a time a very well-to-do hotel and Astoria as such was flourishing till there was a change in the, the highways and uh, passengers and people would not stop in Astoria anymore. And that history is a lot more complex, but uh, the, the, Astoria, uh, the Astor Hotel started seeing a downfall and started to crumble till very recently when uh, a developer has been trying to refurbish it and create commercial spaces uh, to build the economy. So when I was asked to do the show, I wanted to use a scaffold again, because a scaffold is a nice symbol of growth. It's an, it's an upward movement. And I chose to paint this scaffold uh, a golden as, as a homage to something that is um, going to do well. Like you give things in yellow and gold when you want someone to prosper. Well, we do in India. So I wanted to play with that same idea. And I thought the gold looked really nice and resonated the history of this grand hotel that was now crumbling. Along with the scaffolds, I also had a sound that was playing intermittently. I'm very interested in field recordings. So I recorded the sound of the scaffold being built and I played that intermittently. So as you would walk around the space, you would uh, hear just the sounds of, you know, this metal clanking and it recalled the, for me, the ghosts of the past guests, hence the title of the show, which was Mineral Spirits. All right. And for this work, I purchased scaffolds and now I own them. And as I do more scaffold work, which you'll see soon, I take these scaffolds with me and it's kind of interesting. I can use it to build and then it becomes the work itself. So along with the site-based works, I also have a focused drawing practice. And sometimes these drawings I create uh, studies for installations and they serve as blueprints, but sometimes these drawings are standalone drawings itself. And now I'm gonna talk about one of my more favorite projects. And being that I'm giving this talk in Portland, I don't have to explain to anyone the glory of the Portland Trailblazers and this amazing building, which some of you may not like, but I think it is gorgeous. and um, I know it has a very tainted history, which doesn't forgive some of its decisions, but it exists. It did put Portland on the architectural map and there's been talks of demolishing it, but right now it is in the register of, uh, in, it is registered by the Historical Society and there's work being done to make it a more uh, efficient, space that does more than just host games for the Winter Hawks. Uh, my obsession with the Coliseum started, uh, well, I'm interested in architecture and grids and symmetry already, but after walking back from Blazer Games, I would stare at this building and when I found out that it was going to be demolished potentially or was under scrutiny, I started to draw it and my drawings just, I was making, I was make a drawing or two but that obsession didn't stop. So I kept making work, which eventually led to a show at the Portland Art Museum in 2018. That's Bill Walton. And 
I found out yesterday that I might be on a podcast with him, which is very exciting. So stay tuned. Well, this is when they won the champ when we won our one and only championship in 1977. So being a Blazer fan definitely adds to my fascination for the Veterans Memorial Coliseum. But more than just the Blazer connection, I'm really very much interested in the structure of the building and how it's basically a circle in a square. And you, that's li literally how you can draw it. And what was fun was like, I didn't have to think about what I want to make. I had a building and I could draw it directly the way I saw it. I could distort it if I needed. I could make prints of it, which I did at Pro Shadow. Or I could even make a book of it, which I did. So this is a limit. This is my first artist book that this interest in the Coliseum allowed me to make. It was a collaboration with Martha Lewis, who's a designer in Portland. And it included text by Brian Libby, who's an who's a, a architectural writer. And, um, and also Grace Cook Anderson, who I think you guys have had in the past too. And then the Blazers invited me to make, make a little poster. So this is as commercial as I get. And it was for a game versus Chicago, which thankfully we won. Um, and for the poster, I decided to hint at the architecture of Chicago and Portland, as you can see out here. Um, after having an obsessive relationship with the Memorial Coliseum, I decided to investigate a few other buildings, starting with one of my earlier interests, which was the Georgia State Archives, a building that I would look at often while I lived in Atlanta from 2003 to or four to 2009. This monolithic marble structure was built in 64 and demolished in 2017 because people thought it was sinking the land. I want to think that they were incorrect because this, this monolithic marble structure should not have been destroyed. It was just simply blocky and gorgeous and, and kind of brutal. It, it, it stored the Georgia archives, which is why the name, and it had no windows and you could see it from anywhere. So for my second obsession with the building, I started to create drawings with sketches. And these were sketches that started in about March, April last year during the pandemic where I couldn't go to my studio initially. So I had to work on a smaller scale and just keep making drawings of the same building over and again, over and over again with just slight shifts in scale, et cetera. And once I could get to my studio, I made larger works with graphite on paper and the black in the background, which is all acrylic. And all of these drawings were eventually shown at a show called um, Ice Ice at the End Gallery in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And I might still make more drawings of uh, the Georgia archives, but for now I'm taking a pause. Um, there's another building that I'm obsessed with, and it's a skinny tall building in Manhattan called 432 Park Avenue. Um, it's a skinny building. If you look at the Manhattan skyline, it just sticks out. And currently it's under scrutiny because people living in there think it's swaying and it's, it's risky, but it is an architectural marvel. And uh, there's images of it on my website, but I'm gonna move ahead to my last two installations. So this is an installation I did last year. And just like the aqua mapping uh, installation, it, this came out through a really wild idea. I was driving back from Pendleton, Oregon to Portland to receive a fellowship. And an uncle of mine said, you're getting this fellowship and what are you gonna do with all this money? I said, I don't know, for all I care, I'm gonna build a pink scaffold in the middle of a big white field. And that was the crux of the idea that came to me just while driving and pulling over. And then um, uh, I knew right then that I had to make the idea happen. So I went to India to explore the salt flats and started, I, I, I was very lucky. I met the right people who had a factory and they were looking to do something with an artist. So it was literally a wild shot. And months later, here I am, I arrive in Kutch, India, I've had conversations with these people and they have a crew of people ready for me. They've organized new scaffolds because obviously I'm not gonna carry my scaffolds from the US to India. While my scaffolds are being painted, I'm in this factory looking at all the empty containers, using them as Lego sets to finalize the formation of my scaffold, coming up with permutations. 
I knew I was going to work with pink. I didn't quite know why it was my first intuitive choice. But in closer uh, uh, thinking, I realized a lot of that pink came from the landscape, the flamingos of the neighboring grasslands, and the, the shocking pink that is seen in the embroidery of the Rana Kutch. And of course, in the morning, there's a beautiful glow in a, in a desert, and I'm seeing it now at Yucca Valley too, the glow of the, of the sun as it, as it emerges and the pink that it creates in the landscape. So it was a no-brainer that I was gonna work with pink. Then of course, I was obsessing about what kind of pink and here I drove, this is how we get paint in India. We don't have Home Depot style cards where you can multiple choices, you choose and you go with it. So this poor guy had to do pink tests for me and we were making different combinations. And I guess we finally arrived at this one and then started painting. And it was, this is the most help I've ever had in any, with any installation. And I was spoiled because months later I came back to the US. Well, a month later I came back to the US and had to paint my scaffolds myself. So here we are all lined up. The, the hardest part with this installation was actually carrying the scaffolds to the site every day because this is on a big white open landscape. You can't really drive after a certain point. So we spent three days just carrying the scaffolds and I carried the scaffolds with the nine, 10 guys that were helping me. It took us three days to just get them out there. And gradually and slowly, and as you can see, we don't really believe in safety, which is terrible. These guys, while they were doing the earlier stacks, didn't bother with hard hats. They'd only wear their hard hats and proper shoes if a supervisor was coming to check on them. And they were like, look, you know, we're doing our job back off. Tell, if, if anyone gets hurt, it's on us. But I was of course very, very concerned as they were painting, building, and as you can see, going really high up. There is a supervisor on site. Oh, I think by the time we reached this level, I also put my foot down and was like, you need to wear your hard hats. With this installation, what was interesting is like, you know, these guys are day laborers from the neighboring villages. They do what they're told. They're not necessarily into art. And they, they would say, Madam, what is this you're doing? What is, why are you doing this? Is it, is it, are you going to have a show in here? I was like, no. I said, just, just wait and see. And every day at five when construction or building would stop, these guys would leave. And the second day, as soon as we were done and we had been built it up to about two levels, all of them just stopped and started taking photographs and selfies. I was like, why are you taking photos? This is just a pink thing, as you said. They said, no, 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 this is really pretty. We want to take a photo and send it to our wife and child back home. And they're like, now we understand why you did it. So that to me was way more satisfying uh, a response than any kind of maybe review I've gotten because just someone not really aware of what I was trying to do got it and it, it just made them happy and made them smile even if it was just for a moment. So here we are, a little more of the build up. That's my crew, very cool guys. And then we had a mini opening where people, tourists from the local area came by and they just flocked to it and they're like, what is this thing? These people weren't expecting, this isn't Art X, Desert X or nor is it burning man thank god and they're like what the heck is this thing i was like it is what it is and they're like is it a selfie point i'm like call it a selfie point if you want but it is what it is enjoy and they enjoyed it quite tremendously and this was one of my most epic shots that i didn't expect with the night sky and i'm going to scrub through some of this it's a short video
so these instruments that you see them it, uh, the instruments that are, they were playing are all very local instruments and these guys were local musicians too and for the so-called opening i wanted to you know celebrate with some of those those sounds and it turned into quite a fun little affair so that was december 2019 the idea was to keep the scaffold there till till january till february end feb 2020 and then uh, they were going to relocate it to a site where the sand was uh, whiter, the salt was whiter, but it was away from the public, uh, where the common uh, public could access it. It was in a more private land. It was uh, restructured on that new private land in, in February. And by end March, the goal was to take it down because by then the salt starts to get softer and it can start to sink. And by July, the monsoon hits and then it's kind of dangerous. But of course, in March, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. India is on a lockdown and there's no way they could touch the scaffold. So suddenly it's just standing there. No one's around it. And it's gradually starting to sink. By July, August, the monsoon hits and this very dry land is now surrounded by water. And then by September, it's starting to collapse. And I was trying to get people to go out there and record it. But the one friend of mine who was supposed to go, his family got COVID and obviously he couldn't. And I was like, the last thing I need to think about is this work when, you know, we're in the middle of a crisis. But it's been interesting how people still report back to me about the state it's in now. And, um, and how it's still, you know, it's standing there is this maybe a sign of hope or the one thing that hasn't changed so much. And I decided to throw this in very randomly because yesterday I have one of your former people, Kyla, was talking about how her work was used on the cover of a book and how it, you know, it gives a new lens to your work. And I realized one of my colleagues at WSU in Pullman, Nishant Sani, he's coming out with a book or the book has just come out. And although the work is not a political statement, nor is it overtly a, cha a statement on uh, climate change, nor is it a statement on, uh, on uh, queer theory, this, Nishant thought this would be the perfect cover for his book that is talking about all these things, globalizations, Hindutva and uh, queer triangles in contemporary India. And I was honored when he asked me and he said, you know, the ubiquitous, ubiquitous, uh, ubiquity and uh, abstraction of this work is what lends itself so powerfully to what I'm trying to do. And that's what's important to me. I, I don't assign meaning to my work. I make what I make. There's, there's certain things that trigger the choices of color, the location, the formation. But I, I let the narrative be developed by the audience. So after that epic work, I was basically making drawings for most of 2020 till my colleague in, at WSU Vancouver encouraged me to 3D print scaffolds so that I could take them with me on all these little journeys and make micro installations, which I did. And while I was working in these plastic little things was nice, ultimately I chose to print them, 3D print them in uh, uh, nickel plated steel that then led to a show at Agenda in uh, Portland, Oregon. It's the tiniest installation I've done, but it was kind of fun working with sound, light, shadow on a scale that was tiny and therefore manageable. While making these works, I also thought it would be fun to make some prints. And I started working with embossings on paper. Um, while I was making the embossings, I realized that some of the fragments of this, the, the scaffolds that I had were broken. And instead of printing new, clean ones, I wanted the history of the original plastic scaffolds to be literally embedded in the work itself. So this is the work I did earlier this year. And most recently, I've been, I finished this project, which started in, um, which is in Ashland, Oregon, and it's part of Art Beyond, an outdoor adventure, kind of like Desert X, but having seen some of Desert X, I think Art Beyond is better. So I encourage you guys to Go to Ashland sometime in the next month and a half and see some of these outdoor installations that are from artists from Pacific Northwest and all over California. Although this wasn't an epic piece like the one I did in India, there was something really nice about going wider and lower and creating it on a ranch where goats and human beings roam freely.
and the goats came and visited my work, which was fun. This is a little hint of the install of the piece. I was very grateful to the students and faculty of Southern Oregon University who helped me make this. And they were having a wild time too. They were like, we've been cooped up for so long. It's nice to get out and do some physical work. So I was like, go there, jump as much as you want. And the students, she's like, can I jump around in my clown outfit? I was like, do what you want. And we got some really lovely shots in the process. And next, uh, in June, I go back to Ashland. And on the 5th of June, Terry Longshaw, who is a musician, is going to create a performance in response to the scaffold and on the scaffold. Him and his ensemble of six guys uh, created a sound composition called Scaffolding the Clouds, something like that. And they're going to be using drumsticks to hit the scaffold. That's the view of the yellow scaffold as you exit the ranch. These are some fun little visitors. And that's the end of my talk. And I, I hope I didn't rush through too many things, nor do I hope I talked for too long. And I said some inappropriate things, but it's on YouTube, whatever. <laughs> no, it was a wonderful talk. You did a great job. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? They want to start off? And can I just share one more thing before we mm -hmm. start? Selfishly. No, it's okay. I feel I owe this to Alex because I'm obsessed with grids and I didn't really get a chance to talk about the grid. So this is the second building I'm really into. It's the 432 Park Avenue West where I made a series of drawings, prints, et cetera. So yeah, that's my website, very simple, vantakabhava.net, because I didn't take care of my URL and someone bought .com. So whatever your name is, get every domain in the work, in, in there. So yeah, my website features all these things I've been talking about and also additions. If you're a musician and you have a Bandcamp account, I feel really cool because I have a Bandcamp account too and I have only two followers. So help me change that. All right. That's all I got to say. But questions, please. Yes. What was your um, favorite project to work on? Oh my. <laughs> It's, I go back and forth. Like, I love the big installations where you meet people. Like, I'm a huge extrovert and I like traveling and I like working with educational institutions, like at Southern Oregon, because students are great. And, you know, but I also enjoyed working with all those guys in, 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 in India for both the project with the orange ball and the pink scaffold. But so I, the pink scaffold was definitely great but like you know I didn't get to do as much physically I was planning it. it it was where I was most physically removed though I did do some work likewise with the yellow so I like the the scale of those things but there's something very satisfying of the being in the studio by myself obsessively making grid drawings or just making the perfect line where it's just me myself and I and it's kind of monistic so I can't say, I, I don't know. I liked working on all the works I did for the Coliseum series. The Pink Scaffold was definitely great. Every, every experience is unique. Thank you. Yeah. This, this was so exciting. Um, I guess I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of questions. Um, the aqua mapping that last moment was that literally the last moment of the of the project uh the, it was just the orange ball by itself yeah it was last moment for the the recording in baltimore and awesome. after that we were like okay done <laughs> absolutely oh so, i was so scared and that's the thing with these larger projects it's like people's lives could be at risk like but when you're drawing a block on paper no one's going to die but if you're going to float an orange ball in the middle of winter in Baltimore and you fall, you know, it could be terrible if you're building a scaffold. So safety is huge. And 
Yeah. And why was the why was the the graveyard of the Pacific Northwest? Why was that important to you? I live I I I live here, and I you know I, I as I mentioned earlier too, I grew up in a naval family, so getting out on ships and boats. And when my parents visited, my dad was really intrigued by. Uh, why Astoria is such a hard place to navigate and apparently it's something sailors all around the world talk about. So taking a little ball, navigating those little passages, maybe they weren't as as um, uh, complex as what the pilots of ships have had to navigate, but drawing attention to Astoria, Oregon and not Astoria, New York, which a lot of my friends in New York, they're like, oh, you're in, in New York. I'm like, no, this is Astoria, Oregon, way more interesting. I mean, there's many other coastlines that I'm interested in. I could spend two years just taking the ball and floating with it, pitching. Well, I'm also, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hugging and I won't, I won't do any more. Yeah. Um, the, pink, ugh, the pink is just so stunning. And I'm wondering about the connections. Somehow it feels like bridges to me and you have one um, that has those X's and then bridging right up to it is something very different. And I wonder, is that something about you bridging cultures? Um, what's the, the thought behind that? And that, that, that's what I was saying too. Like I try not to assign the meaning. I'm maybe at some subconscious level thinking of these things, but I want the audience to find these connections, whether it's my friend who said, this is a perfect example of climate change. Can we use your image and talk about it? I'm like, sure. Or can we talk about, because it's pink, can we talk about queer triangles in India? Or it's also very close to Pakistan, which is, you know, a border, uh, a neighboring country and our relationship is sometimes not the best. So it has all of these, these subtexts that I encourage people to talk about, which they do as you are doing now. And by bringing them together, I guess. But at the end of the day, it's that first gut formal response. Like I like the Colosseum because it's a grid, the Colosseum important. I wanted to see pink, a giant thing of pink on a white background. I wanted to see this bright yellow on a green field, which is what I did in Ashland. And I think we undermine how smart human beings are, but we also as artists, we overfeed our audience sometimes. And we need to stop doing that. Like I teach, I know writing an artist statement is a pain and it's good to do it, but if your work is gonna rely on an artist statement, then, then that's pointless. Right, Ralph? You gotta make our audience work a little harder too. Oh, uh, for sure. I think that, you know, it's supposed to challenge audiences. Um, I mean, I have a few questions that kind of like tie to that. Um, and I don't want to hog either, <laughs> as Kathy would say. But to start off, since it's like tied to this conversation, like I'm really curious about, I mean, it seems like, you know, to work on things that are like in large scale and for it to be, um, well, for these project-based works to be in interaction with fabricators, installers, um, construction workers, folks that might not have like that close of a tie to artistic practice. Mm -hmm. That it's like, there are ways that you might need to communicate what it is that you're trying to do mm -hmm. in order to achieve what it is that you want. Mm -hmm. and in many ways you're working in like it, it, it in abstraction, right? Mm -hmm. And like geometry and like abstraction and geometry can oftentimes, it's not opaque for like an art audience, but it can oftentimes be opaque for like non-art viewing audiences. Wow. That's like why somebody might be interested in, in that. And I was just kind of like wondering, how do you sort of like talk about that with folks? I mean, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit well, I, I don't want to go to that question yet. Maybe like, you know, we'll, we'll stay with this question, which is like, how do you like communicate an idea to somebody that might like not have like a contextual understanding of where you're coming from? I, I will often pose the questions to them. And when they answer it, they get the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can and you can you give them an example of that? It's, it's like the guys in India, you know, who are the least art savvy audience. They're like, the first day we started putting pink scaffolds, they're like, what the heck is, why are you doing this? 
by the second day when we went up to two levels and they stepped back and they saw it looked really beautiful they were like we can't explain but we really like what what's going on out here and then one guy even said art for art's sake i was like dude good <laughs> like yeah literally art for art's sake <laughs> um and i think sometimes people do want narratives and you know if i say yes i chose pink because of reason a b and c i chose a scapegoat because of c d and e i don't like being prescriptive like that but in certain cases like whether it's an educational setting or someone who's very new to getting it, i i don't mind warming them up in that sense i'm you know i don't want to be an ass either and being like figure it out for yourself i write artist statements i had a statement for this thing too and i needed to do that to get clearance to erect the scaffold whether it was in ashland or in 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 at the round of kutch like the local authorities wanted reduced to bullet points and i think there's something good in being it's like the elevator spiel we ask you guys to do like why are you building a scaffold i'm building a scaffold because it is a beautiful ready made it has horizontal verticals and diagonals elements that i am drawn to and it is easy to access oh what else why is it socially interesting oh it's a ubiquitous functional object that i want to i want to bring raise the underdog and do you feel like that's kind of like the understanding so it's like in, in that big scaffold piece that you had in an open field mm -hmm. uh where at some point you know people people that were part of the project were uh, kind of like curious about what you were intending to do and then at some point they started getting it do you feel like that's kind of like what their understanding is or do you have like any other insight as to like what their understanding was of like why you were interested in building that i think their their abstract response was the was the most satisfying and the fact that they were hanging around for a long time and taking photographs and couldn't step away from it Thank and it you. was eventually a you know formal gesture but again with something like the coliseum yes there's a few more reasons i was interested in it i'm interested in the history of that building in portland what it did to portland the controversies surrounding it of course i latched on to the blazer fandom that came with it And I was like, you know, and there was one critic who was like, oh, this is Avantika just obsessed with the blazers. I was like, no, that's one aspect of it. I like the blazers, but I like this building and my interest in this work stems from my interest in the structure of the building. There's also something to be said about like it being, I mean, it's a testament to like, um, you know, the underdog, right? But then there's also like, it also becomes like, I mean, to me, it's like more of a, like a testament to like things being in a state of becoming mm -hmm. and how, you know, like in a capitalist world, we're like very results oriented and yeah. like a product oriented. Yes. And I like that. I like that it's like, you know, like those scaffolds could go on forever, but it's like, yeah. it, you know, like it, it, yeah, like it, it's kind of like, um teeters on the state of becoming that's like really pleasant to also look at and yeah and on that note i i mean i guess this is obvious i've never done a permanent installation and maybe i will one day if the situation is good but there's something nice about the temporality of those things it's not a final product likewise with what i'm doing here i like i'm excited to see the glass thing that i might get but the the images of the molds the wax those are just as gorgeous and it you know it's not the product but there's something very nice about that raw authentic thing i think andrea has a question yeah yeah um thank you for your presentation i love your work um i am wondering if um what the bridge is between the scaffolding and drawing for you uh -huh. um because they're very much like um realized drawings out in the world which is really cool and uh i was wondering if you ever draw your scaffolding as architectural spaces after they've been erected or if you have drawings of them um or schematics or anything I, I and if you, you have that same sort of you said monastic uh, -huh. uh sort of space that that um for drawing yeah 
Yeah, I, I, when I plan the scaffolds, I'll often make drawings. I'll, I'll take photographs of the site and maybe draw on those photographs, printouts of those photographs, or I'll just come up with a really simple sketch. At a very late age, I discovered the magic of Lego and how easily I can recreate what I want with Lego. And I also realized just like by 3D printing my scaffolds, I can actually create um, a mini version of what I want to do. But have I actually looked at some of the scaffolds and drawn them? Not yet, but I made prints of them. And I don't know if I, I'm going to give the drawing aspect a shot, but I think it's a little too complex for a drawing. I, I don't know. I don't know. But it's something that I'm thinking about. I may or may not do, but I like I like the, the embossings of them. But yes, those are big drawings for me. Scaffolds are three-dimensional drawings. Safai, you can go ahead right now if you had like a Oh, I just had a comment about on the Legos. Yeah. <laughs> I used to build with Lego suits. Did you like use the mini ones or like the gigantic ones? Or because I remember I used to make mansions. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm just curious, like what kind of Lego buildings did you build? <laughs> I, well, when I came back from India and my Sphinx scaffold had to be shifted to a newer, more open location, they wanted sketches and as many visual clues. And of course, if I was good at CAD, I could whip it out, but I'm, I'm not. So I made sketches and then I made the model with these mini Legos. Okay, okay. That I took for my friend's child. Okay, cool. I think I just need to buy my own Legos and actually, hold on. It didn't need to get out, but I actually have this right here. These are the... I, these oh, are the, okay, okay. It's so cool. crappy though right now. <laughs> no, that, that's it's cool. So when I went to Ashland, I took these with me. And as the crew was um, building the scaffold, and the irony is, you would, I'm doing this slowly so you, my virtual background doesn't kill it. I wanted to be as prepared because we got to Ashland on the 1st of May. And the install time was quick. It was like from 2 to 7. And they're like, you have seven people here. These are students. You may not get them again. What is your plan? And I was like, I've never seen this site because I couldn't see the site before that. It was still under snow. I'd seen photographs of it. I made sketches, but once you're on the site, things change. So here these guys are unloading and there I have my little mini maquettes and moving them around to quickly decide how I want it formed. And there's other variables like you can't build too high out here because the ground is a little softer. Um, you, you know, so it's like, even though you have a perfect plan, you have to stay a little bit flexible based on what the land will dictate. Kind of, sorry, it kind of reminds me of Minecraft. <laughs> yeah. 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 A little bit. I had a question about what you said towards like the beginning of your artist talk about um, how you're trying, I, I believe you said you were trying to break down the hierarchy between about drawing or sketching and like the finished product of the pieces. I was wondering if you could speak on that just a little bit more. Uh, sure, I think sometimes people ruin things by overdoing it or by just working on it. And sketches, why does a sketch have to be a thing that serves a painting or a maquette, a thing that serves a final? Can the maquette, it's like, it's a, obviously there's a functional reason it serves as the initial generation of an idea, but there's so many artists historically whose sketches are more revered than their final works themselves. But in, in my practice too, like, like Andrea was saying, I build the scaffold, but now I make, make, make a drawing of, a more abstracted drawing of the structure I created, like I did with those mini installations at McDowell. Um, so even though the drawing, the 2D work came from the 3D work, doesn't make the 2D work less significant than the final 3D work. Very often with these installations, as I'm making the installations, I'll make drawings that are showcased with the installation and then the installation doesn't exist anymore because it's a time-based space. And although I have photographs of the installation, I feel the sketches that I make are more authentic because it's their, their mind, they, they, they record the documentation, but also the, the physical and <clears throat> conceptual documentation. 
Thank you. That's really interesting. I was also wondering if you wanted to speak on your experience and experiences right now at this residency that you're at and what you're working on for everyone. Oh God, yeah. This it's you know the the location is gorgeous for one, and it's very it is very uh, inspiring to see an artist like Heidi Schweger who is doing really is doing is an amazing artist was. Uh, a chair at the M in the at PNCA OCAC, and they decided they just wanted a super shift in their career and their life, and they bought land in the middle of nowhere. And they said, "We're going to start this thing." So for all of us who are above 40, 45, we're like, "Oh, we still haven't done this, that, the other." Like life is young; so you can still completely shift gears at an older age, and that's inspiring. It's inspiring to see someone do that. Um, I've never been to a, a, a teaching residency. This is my first. I've done many residencies, but it's also been very humbling to learn about the glass process and the casting process. And being a being an educator, I have not been in the uh, uh, the student seat for a long time. So it's nice to be in that opposite. And I keep saying this is a B minus, and Heidi's like, no, it's more like an A. I'm like, no, it's a super B minus. <laughs> So I, I keep grading what I do. And I think, you know, if this was the end of the semester, I might get a B minus, I don't know. <laughs> but I, what I'm leaving with, even though I might not have a good product, I think the knowledge I'm leaving with is an A plus. And I'm excited to take that further and see what else I can do. And tomorrow, if I work with a fabricator, which I will, in glass, I, I feel a little more comfortable. Like I'm not just asking someone to make my work in a process I barely know. It's a process I've indulged in. I have a, a better understanding of, and I'm painfully aware of the fact that I'm not a master in it, not even close. It's like when we were carrying the scaffolds in the desert, like in, in the US you do all your work, but in India there's like hundred people who work for you because labor is cheap. And those guys were surprised like every day when we were carrying the scaffolds from the truck to the site, it was a kilometer, which is about three quarters of a mile. They're like, why are you carrying? You are, you're supposed to sit and dictate. I said, no, if you are carrying a scaffold, I will too. And, and because I kept carrying with them, you know, I think we went a little faster because they do like to take a lot of breaks. So I was like, no, I'm going, if I can keep going, you can keep going. Thank you. I really love it hearing like your work ethic and that you want to work and engage with these people, but also in your own process and you're going to be hands-on with it. I was going to ask if anybody else had any more questions. I have one, but I can go after you. I'm mm -hmm. Oh no, you can go ahead. I was just saying. Oh yeah. I was wondering, I mean, guys, my unsurprising question, if you could elaborate or speak more to, I guess, your interest in grids and then also sort of which I know is like the broadest question, like there's so many different ways to go with it. But yeah. I guess where I'm particularly curious is uh, with, with how, uh, how much your work references architecture, which then references, which, you know, uh, the, you know, the grid has so much architectural, organizational, structural reference. Uh, so I'm wondering if maybe that was derived from architecture or if you had your interest in, in kind of if it was more foundational in art and then that transition to architecture or sort of where that started and how that kind of process. I, I've never thought about it, how I got interested in it, but I know I, I have an answer now, but I, I, I like it because it's kind of foolproof. It's like one thing again and again and again, and then repeat and again and again. It's almost like teaching, especially if you've been teaching the same kind of class over and over again. It, it also parallels like this dogmatic life we live more, more so in the West with nine to five or nine to eight. And everyone has a schedule everyone has a calendar. The calendar is a grid. There's something dogmatic and ridiculous about it. And I want to embrace that dogmatic ridiculousness by bringing it in my work. But I think some of the more exciting moments in my drawings where I use grids happen when the grids are seemingly exact, but they're clearly not. And for all artists who work with grids, I think this is something we enjoy. We're not making a mechanical grid. But uh, when I first came to the US in 99, uh, 96 and I landed in Chicago, I left from Baroda and New Delhi in India, two very chaotic cities. And suddenly like I'm in the middle of a grid in Chicago, every street 
it, I was living in a grid. I, I was fascinated by that. It was so easy to not get lost. And yet I did. But yeah, I like the simplicity and the ease of a grid, but also how not so simple it necessarily is when you walk through it or make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, and then I guess kind of going off of that too is something else I was interested that you're talking about was kind of, well, I, I guess partially in reference to drawing with that immediacy, but then also with the scaffolding being somewhat of a ready-made uh -huh. and that ability to move through because I, I mean, there's definitely ways to work with a grid with the degree of quickness, like, uh, like your work has elements of that, but I, I guess, well, and this is probably my own bias, but when I think of a lot of grid work, I don't think of immediacy as no. more of like a labored process. So I was yes. curious. Yes where that sat for you or yeah, how you process and, it. And so much mathematics. So my, I mean, since I started working on the Colosseum, which was one of the first works I did with used a grid, I realized how poor I'd become at math. And I come from a family of math geniuses, like my brother, my dad, my nieces, all outstanding. And I was like the artist in the family. I was decent at math, but not terrible. But I had to take tutorials and basic decimals and calculations. And of course, the calculator helps. And uh, I don't know if you noticed this since you work with grids, like working with, with the metric system is way more helpful right yeah. now, especially, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, but well, it's actually, I guess on my own, it's funny you say that because I don't, I stick to standard because I like that it's kind of obtuse and yeah. like, makes it a little clunkier and then also that it's kind of but like the history of it is more weighted in like bodily measurements and things whereas metrics so scientific so I kind of like that it is messy because I yeah I'm always like I should just switch to metric because the math yeah. takes two seconds instead yeah. I'm doing like yeah. the 0. 0.0625 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. thousand yeah. times yeah <laughs> but yeah thank you for answering those yeah. but yeah the work is simple but you know it's it's what um my, my friend and colleague, Judy Bauman, who is a master printer at Crow Shadow, where Ralph was just now, she's like, your work is so deceptively simple because some of the prints we did at Crow Shadow, we were really trying to get these flat fields of color and it was not easy. So that simplicity is like, even now I've just been spending three days trying to get a straight line in a mold. So it's simple, it, but it's deceptively simple. Getting a flat color, getting a straight line, getting that perfect angle, getting that grid that's not just a little off. And even when you embrace that perfection, there will still be flaws. So knowing when the flaws and the perfection are in a nice conversation and to back off is, is, is important. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, having that, I think, an element with Brizzy as having that humanness yes. or something, yeah. some imperfection to it. Yep. So, I, yeah, go ahead. I was just curious, I guess a follow-up question. Um, how long do you spend on um, calculations? And if, if it's okay to ask, like, what yeah. is the process? Oh, <laughs> there's no process. Okay. I feel I need to go to New Jersey and spend a week with my 14 year old niece who's the math wizard and just get like, how do you do this thing again? <laughs> um, I think I start by literally sketching it out and then measuring it and making sure my, my straight edge is clean. And then checking like measuring three times and then drawing slash cutting once. Sometimes like I'll take a photograph and I'll blow it up and then see the measure of the blurred blown up proportion. Knowing that perspective can kick in. And this, yeah, it was interesting when I, I was at a residency at UCross in 2017, trying to make this two point perspective drawing of the Coliseum. And I was struggling. And then I, I had a, this moment of revelation where I was like, wait a second, I teach linear perspective. And I need to like, even though it's very, dry I love teaching it and I know the rules well so I did exactly what I tell my students to do with strings and you know all those and I was like okay this is me geeking out but it was very satisfying thank you yeah yes Andrea um I was wondering you're saying that you know the 
we like to break down the hierarchy of um, drawings and sketches. And uh, since your work um, walks the line of, you, you say, perfectionism, uh, you know, finding that perfect, that sweet spot of a, a straight line versus a little bit of um, human wobbliness, I guess. How do you have preliminary, do you make preliminary sketches for sketches or when you're going in to make a drawing, will you know, do you know that this is, this is going to be the final drawing? I, I make, sense. I will make preliminary sketches and sometimes the first sketch I make is the one that I will work with further. But I, I like to make a lot of quick sketches and then I set them aside and, and say, okay, which one of these sketches should I transform into a drawing? And then I even make notes, like shift a little bit, darken this. And before I leave the studio every night, if I'm working on a drawing, I like to clean my table and leave a couple of notes that if it's like, if I'm itching to darken one part of the drawing, I won't darken it, but I leave a note because when I come back, I want something inviting me right back in. So instead of leaving with a sense of finality, I leave with a little bit of, okay, when you come back, you need to do this thing first. It becomes a bit of a game for me. Drawing is a game and it's also surgery. It's like, you have to use your intuition, but you also have to be very careful and calculated. And because of the way I work, I have to wash my hands a lot. So every time I stop, wash, sharpen pencils, it forces me to re-examine things. And this sounds a little weird, but I've noticed like if I'm pissed at someone and I'm thinking about it when I'm drawing and I'm, I, there's, there's always something goes wrong. So I have to be in a good mood or in a positive mood and not have any ill feelings towards anyone, which sounds really hokey, but yeah. Do we have any more questions? So how many of y'all are, are doing a show this week? I know Alex is or in the next week or two. Yeah, I have, yeah, mine will be at yeah, the show at Holding for the 31st and then June 1st and then Darby, um, I'm not sure when the, the, um, PSU graduation show opens, but that's pretty soon. I don't know if Ralph notes the date for it, but Darby will be in that one. Great. Well, if there's anything up after the sixth, then let me know. I'd love to check it out. Yeah, and the the show at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum uh, will open next week on the twenty fourth, and okay. then it'll it'll end on the twenty seventh of June. Okay, and that's the Schnitzer downtown. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, I'll definitely go see it. See it. It's right there. Well, thank you so much, guys. This was mm -hmm. fun. And good luck with your shows or your next year mm -hmm. or the third or whatever awaits you. I think, yeah, some of you are leaving town. Thank you so much. I, I, I love that little piece you showed, the glass. Oh, the thank you. Sweet. I can't wait to see more. Oh, me too. I'm going to go make some molds now. So fun. I could be in my studio making a drawing with a clean pencil, but no, I have to go make some molds now. It's going to be great. <laughs> There's something nice about soaking your hand in plaster, though, when it's wet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Avantika, for joining us today. It was wonderful to hear you talk about your work and like your process. Um, this is going to conclude our, our remote artist talk series for this week. And for those who are turning, tuning in, please join us again next Wednesday morning for a talk with Sergio Delgado Moya. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Ralph. Thanks, Avantika. Thank you. Bye. Bye.